Hi everyone. Uh, we are Group Five. Uh, I'm Yatsham. Uh, I got my teammate Adrian and Caesar and Jatin here as well. Mm -hmm. So we are going to present the paper Mamut, a simple architecture for joint learning for multimodal tasks. It was uh, it was published in TMLR in August 2023. It was from Google Research. So we're going to start with a little bit of background and motivation behind this work. So as we all know, like uh, the recent back uh, the recent breakthrough that we have seen. Uh, in the large vision language models can be largely attributed to the success of CLIP and the uh, families of models that we got from CLIP as well. So they basically have a dual encoder architecture where you have a, a text encoder and a image encoder. The uh, and the image encoder can have a backbone like uh, the VIT text encoder usually have a transformer. And we've seen that these kinds of models have been uh, very successful in things like image understanding, and retrieval tasks like text to image and image to text retrieval. And then uh, we have another family of model. Um, I think uh, this trend started back in like 2015 with the paper of visual question answering. Here we have a, we have a demonstration where you have a, uh, where the model, is, uh, where the, uh, the target of the model is basically uh, mask, uh, mask token modeling or like auto regressive modeling. So like uh, the, the, the model that we have here is from uh, Sim VLM. And these kinds of models, they're uh, particularly good at uh, generative tasks, like uh, visual question answering or caption generation. And in recent times, we have seen, uh, we have seen efforts to join uh, these two kinds of uh, architecture to one single architecture. Uh, we have already discussed COCA in one of our classes. Then there's ALBEF as well. So, so they're basically good for uh, both kinds of tasks, like the retrieval tasks, like and uh, generative task as well, but the authors of uh, Mahmoud argue that uh, these kinds of complex, these kinds of models uh, basically have a very complex architecture, and uh, sometimes they need uh, multiple training stages. And <clears throat> although they're good at <clears throat> things like uh, image captioning or like uh, retrieval task, uh, sometimes for uh, when you're trying to do something like a video captioning or like video question answering, you're going to have to go through a lot of very precise fine tuning and you'll need some special recipe for that. So as a solution, the authors uh, introduce Mammoth here. As you can see, uh, Mammoth has a pretty simple architecture. It only has one decoder instead of like two decoders that you see in Koka, I would say. So you have one visual encoder and then one text decoder. And so the decoder actually uh, calculates the generative loss and the contrastive loss uh, the one decoder actually uh, calculates both of those and it actually does it through uh, something called a two-pass learning method. We're gonna discuss about it later. And because it only has one decoder, it's gonna actually have a shared set of weights that it's gonna use for both kinds of tasks. And the authors tested it against uh, other VLMs on tasks like zero short image retrieval, VQA, open vocabulary object detection. So if you're not familiar with open vocabulary object detection, it's basically like uh, trying to uh, do classification beyond your training set. Let's say uh, in your training set, you have something like toy, an elephant, but in your testing set, you, uh, you're you taking the image of uh, like a playroom. And in the playroom, you have something like a toy crocodile. Uh, so your goal will be to like generate some bounding box and detect something like this is not a toy or this is not a crocodile, this is a toy crocodile. So as you can see here are some performance image to text and text to image retrieval. Then you have open vocabulary detection. It can generate bounding, good bounding boxes with very good accuracy and also the labels. Then you have a visual question answering here, video question answering here as well. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the details of the methodology. So first, Mahmoud uses one encoder and that encoder has a, a VIT backbone and it uses a single text decoder. Uh, so inside the decoder, because <clears throat> your, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you have one decoder that's going to do the unimodal and multimodal, multimodal task at the same time. You're going to need to have cross attention layers inside the text decoder layers. So the ratio of M by N is basically a trade-off, uh, trade-off between the model capacity and its uh, generative capability. So uh, the, in the paper, they actually set it to half, like for uh, for each uh, for two text decoders, they had like one cross attention layers. And one specific thing that they mentioned in the paper is that uh, although their like their model is basically capable of handling different kinds of tasks, they didn't actually use any task specific head for that. 
Okay, so it uses a two-pass learning strategy that we're gonna describe in the next slide to unify. First, uh, first pass is gonna deal with the contrastive learning. Second pass is gonna deal with the generative part or the autoregressive captioning. And it also can do, uh, it's also aware in a localized way and they do it with the help of crop position embedding, another paper from Google Research. And because it only has one decoder, it's going to share uh, the weights. And uh, for the tra for the pre-training part, it uses uh, only a uh, web all text data set. Okay. <clears throat> so the first part here is the contrastive learning contrastive learning part. I'm sorry. Uh, with the uh, calculating the contrastive loss. So so I would I would ask you to think about something like uh, think that uh, this model has three switches. So one is the bidirectional masking here. The another is like uh the causal masking another is the cross attention cross attention and so when you're uh when you have when you're trying to calculate the contrastive loss of the cross entropy loss what you'll do is you you'll just basically turn on the bidirectional masking so your uh text decoder will be able to attend to the entire caption at the same time and it will calculate the contrastive loss but uh the authors directly didn't use contrastive loss and why is that they said like when you uh the the clip or the clip family uh the clip family models they basically need a very large size of uh very large batch size when they're trying to calculate the contrastive loss especially when you're uh, training on a noisy data set <clears throat> so what the author said um it, it's basically a very common method that you that you'll see in a lot of machine learning methods if you're like if you work with a if you were if you have like work with uh, ML papers before that, you'll see like you'll try to focus on the task where you fail multiple times. So the author said we can just focus on more challenging and informative examples. And for that, they use something called focal loss. It's from a paper in 2017. So what does it do? So let's say you have uh, some normalized image embeddings that I will call VI and you have some text embeddings as well. I'll call that LJ. And then you have a uh, hyperparameter tau Actually, it's not a hyperparameter. It's actually a learnable parameter. That was my mistake. I'm sorry. What you're gonna do is basically first calculate the true class probability from these embeddings. So when you uh, when you're working with a similar pair, like similar uh, when the image embeddings and the text embeddings are pretty close to one another, you're gonna get a very high value for PI. And when they're like further apart, you're gonna get a uh, very low value for PI. And then what you're gonna do is basically use one minus PI to the power gamma as a weight for the for the cross entropy loss for every sample. So if you have, uh, uh, if your if the value of PI is very high, you're gonna get a very uh, very low weight for the loss, and if the value of PI is very low, vice versa. So the paper uh, in the paper they do it for image to text and text to image retrieval, and they just simply add them, and then you get the contrastive loss. And the authors say something say something that uh, when you use these kinds of contrastive loss function instead of the regular contrastive loss that was proposed in CLIP, it actually provides additional sensitivity to objects. Cool. Okay, so in the second pass, you turn on the cross attention switch and the causal masking switch. So that would mean uh, you, you'll be able to uh, attend to only the tokens that have come before you and also to the token, uh, to the embedding generated by the image encoder. Then you're gonna generate the negative log likelihood uh, for, I'm sorry, you're gonna generate the negative log likelihood uh, based on the image embedding X and the tokens that you've already seen Y1, 2, Yt minus one. Okay, so this is the entire architecture in the same part. This, it's not a very good figure that they used in the paper, but like, yeah. So you, you weigh the losses with some parameters, lambda cap and lambda focal, that's it. Okay. Now uh, for the localization awareness part, they use something called uh, crop positional embedding. Now, uh, like why did they need it? So the the vision language models that we uh, that we work with usually they're pretty good at uh, they're pretty good at some tasks. Uh, so what they do is basically they take the uh, image uh, full posi full image positional embedding. They have uh, embeddings for each pixel of the photo, or like sixteen by sixteen things like that. So what they do is uh, they're pretty good for image classification, but when dealing with uh, Object detection, they are not that good because object detection happens usually in usually in region level, not in the entire image. 
So when you uh, so they do not work well for uh, detection at region level. When you try to use the whole uh, image embedding for for detection tasks, uh, you get some mismatch because the image was trained on full positional embedding. So so as a solution for that, they took the help of something called crop positional embedding. It's another paper from Google Research. So to start with, you have the uh, entire positional, uh, entire image positional embedding. Let's say it's 224 by 224. What you're gonna do is you're gonna use some technique. They didn't mention it in the paper, but I'm guessing it's something like bilinear interpolation. They're gonna upsample the positional embedding from, let's say uh, we start with 224 by 224. They're gonna upsample it to like 1024 by 1024. Then they're gonna randomly crop some regions from that upsampled embedding. And after randomly cropping, they're gonna resize it up or resize it down. Let's say you had something like 384 by 512. They're gonna resize it again to 224 by 224. And then they're gonna use that randomly cropped and resized embedding for object level, uh, for region level object detection. So yeah, so that was their uh, proposition embedding for localized and awareness. And then for video tasks, they argue that uh, the vision language models that we have discussed so far, they usually do, uh, they usually approach it by, they usually approach, they usually take some frame by frame processing approach where you, where you take each frames and then you uh, use VIT and then you generate 2D patches from them and then you learn information from each frame. But when you do that, what you're doing is basically capturing the information in one frame. So you you have a lot of spatial information, but you're uh, missing out on the information like that's flowing between frame to frame. So you're missing out on a lot of temporal information. So what the authors did, they took the motivation from TubeVAT, another paper from Google Research. So what TubeVAT does is it starts with like the regular VIT backbone. So it takes, it uses 2D patches to process the frames, but it also takes some 3D tubes. So if you if you uh, if you think about patches that like that has no gap in between them, if you take uh, a lot of patches in the same region, you're gonna get a whole tube like that. So they they use 3D tubes, like an extended patch to process multiple frames at the same time. And instead of using patches on every single frame, they're gonna they're gonna have sparse temporal site for the patches. That means they're gonna process, let's say, frame three, then they're gonna uh, skip frame four, five, six, then they're gonna process frame seven, things like that. This is just to save some compute and thing, uh, compute. That's it. So the so the three D tubes that we talked about, they can be like uh, they can be of different shape. It can be of shape uh, sixteen times two by two. Then it would look like a tube. But if you have something that's like eight by eight by eight, that would look something like a cube. And they said uh, the the reason for using different kinds of uh, different shapes of tube, uh, tube and cube is basically to capture like when you have a long tube, you're gonna have more temporal information and you will be able to recognize actions that are like, that take over a long period of time. And when you have cubes of same shape, uh, you can actually focus equally on special uh, spatial information and temporal information. Okay, so this is the structure that they, um, that they uh, used in uh, Mahmood paper. As you can see, you have some cubes as well. You, can some, you have some cubes here, and then you have some tubes, then you have some 2D patches for the images as well. So, so uh, the uh, the authors didn't directly use the tube VIT approach here because in tube VIT you have something called fixed positional embedding. So uh, just like uh, regular LLMs, uh, you have to have some positional embeddings for the tubes. So in the tube VIT paper, those uh, positional embedding were basically sine and cosine functions, and they were trying to describe the center of the tubes. Uh, so the authors said. Uh, so yeah, this is like the fixed positional embedding sine, uh, sine or cosine functions. But Mahmood already has learned some embeddings from the encoder. So what the authors did was just add those encoders with, uh, with the, just uh, just did some weighted sum uh, with, with the fixed embeddings that the tube VID learned uh, with the embedding that the Mahmood VID encoder has learned. And then they concatenate, uh, concatenate that with the 2D patches that they generated from the images. And if you look at if you look at the figure, like the 2D patches are sparse. You have some patches from here, then you skipped a lot of frames, then you took some patches from here, then they pass it to the V8 encoder again. Okay. And the important thing is that uh, Mammoth was never pretend on any kind of video data. They actually just find you in a small uh, video data after like after they were done with the pretending part. 
So there's, uh, there's another example, as you can see, uh, for the images, they took the 2D patches when you only have an image uh, image stream. And when you have videos, you took 2D patches from uh, some frames, you just sample it, and then you have some sparse video tubes as well. Okay. Uh, Adrian's gonna discuss the next part. So as for the implementation details, the model is equipped with a VIT huge image encoder and a transformer text decoder with 650 million parameters and 1 billion parameters respectively, where in the text decoder, the cross attention layers were applied every two decoder layers. The Atom W optimizer was used and the weights set for the contrastive and generative losses were both set to one. The pre-training images were resized and then later cropped to 224 to 224 for the sake of localization awareness. And furthermore, a noisy web alt text data set was used for um, generative and contrastive free training with 1.8 billion image text pairs. And for the downstream open vocabulary object detection task, apart from the model being equipped with the mask with mask or CNN heads and box agnostic class heads, it was fine tuned with crop positional embedding. And for ablation studies, a uh, the image encoder and the text decoder were downscaled. So, and as for the results for the zero shot um, image to text and text to image retrieval, the model was compared with other models with comparable image model sizes. And we can see that it yields a state of the art performance in the MS Coco and Flickr 30K data sets. And in the visual question answering setting, the model achieves competitive performance with other models with higher parameter counts. And we can see its performance on certain types of questions here where it does best when answering yes or no questions, but not so much with questions requiring counting. And here we see results simultaneously in the video tasks, specifically in the left table for video QA and in the right for video captioning. Uh, it, in most of the benchmarks here, it achieves state-of-the-art performance, except for on the MSR VTT uh, benchmark and video captioning in the video captioning uh, benchmark on the right, where it falls behind Git and Git2. And overall, it, it just achieves impressive performance on these video tasks where, because it was exclusively pre-trained on uh, image text pairs. And here we see its result, the results in the open vocabulary object detection setting where the average precision scores were reported here. And what's interesting is that we see that the model compared to the other models shown here performs best when, when detecting novel, um, rare, unseen classes rather than the more common classes. And this is likely due to the sensitivity induced to the model in using uh, the focal contrastive loss rather than a classical contrastive loss. And as for the ablation studies, we first observed the cross-task benefits. Uh, and, and in the last row where we see the uh, joint training, the text-to-image text -to -image retrieval uh, performance and the generative VQA performance increases. Uh, and this is likely due to um, contrastive learning uh, enhancing the image text representations. But however, the performance on the image to text retrieval decreases. And here we can see the trade-off in balancing the losses assigned to both the contrastive and generative losses. And if the ratio of weights are skewed more toward the uh, contrastive loss, we see that the performance on the retrieval test increases rather than on the generative uh, DQA task and vice versa. So this shows that the uh, both objectives have a combative nature against each other. And next, we observe the cross-attention design, in which just a few cross-attention uh, layers are needed for the retrieval task, but in the retrieval task for uh, image to text and text to image. But in the uh, VQA task, performance increases when the cross-attention when there's more cross-attention layers. And here we see the uh, different components of uh, video adaptation, such as gated connection, which uh, just uh, in, which is in the, included in the model to determine how much of the raw tube input to incorporate in its representation, fixed embeddings, which handle the sparsity and overlap between e each tube, and having tubes themselves. And we see that they all contribute to, uh, they all benefit model performance, but with tubes having the most benefit, or the model benefits mostly from the tubes. And here we see the effects of projections and attention pooling. And now briefly, uh, projections is uh, like something where we have a, a linear layer to map the image and text representations onto a common feature space. And attention pooling is where we would have a uh, an attention mechanism to aggregate features. And we see here that it's not needed for uh, for joint training, in which uh, ac and sorry not accuracy the recall scores for image to text and text to image ret retrieval increase when they're not included here. 
And this was tested on the Flickr 30K dataset. Now, Mamut was trained completely end-to-end -end from scratch, and as it features the two-pass learning, weights can be shared in the text decoder to handle both of the objectives, and it is computationally cheaper than other models such as Poly, Coca, Flamingo, and Git2. Now, as for the limitations, Mamut relies completely on a WebAlt text data set for pre-training, and this introduces some uh, bias in text generation. So it can it may be liable to generate uh, things like stereotypes, for instance. And it was said by the authors that further investigation is needed here. Also, the model relies completely on a single text decoder for joint learning, and this introduces some conflict between the two, handling the two objectives simultaneously. And we saw this earlier in the uh, in some of the ablation studies tables, in which uh, the, depending how the weights were assigned in the contrastive and generative losses, uh, performance on the retrieval tasks and VQA tasks decreased. Also, the number of atten across attention layers affected the performance uh, in these tasks as well, in which the retrieval tasks preferred fewer rather than on the VQA tasks when more were preferred. And also, performance on the image to text retrieval tasks in general decreased. Um, as we saw earlier in doing joint learning with in both uh, handling the contrastive and object and generative objectives. So in conclusion, the model consists of a single vision encoder and text decoder and having to and having the two pass learning allows weights to be shared in the decoder for the sim simultaneous handling of both uh, contrastive and generative loss. And the model is capable of handling a diverse set of tasks such as image text, text image retrieval, open vocabulary object detection, VQA, video QA, and video captioning. Thank you.